I say something to Twickenham? Oh yeah, we'd love to hear you say something. <laughs> I wanted to say thank you for people that have provide things here so that we can grow and we can be a better person. And I wanted to say thank you that we like we have change here for from your help and I hope we see you soon and I want you to know that we love you so much. Oh Gladys, thank you. We love you. Thank you so much. You you bless us. Keying off the last thing the uh, children said there and the last thing that was on the slide, love is the greatest commandment, I wanted to read this passage from Matthew. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And as we all know, when Jesus told the parable of who is your neighbor, your neighbor can be anyone, anywhere. And these children in Ecuador are as much our neighbor as anyone in the world. The, the thing that they said there at the end, we love you, we thank you, they are really sincere about that. The work that, that we give to that is done down there, they really do appreciate it. And it really does make a big difference in their lives. So I want us to keep that in mind today as we think about what we're going to contribute to the Hacienda and the work that is being done there does provide hope and provide a future for children that would not have had any hope or future otherwise. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for letting us be involved with your work. We thank you for the opportunity to help there. We thank you for the hope that this gives to people, to the children there and to the potential hope with Casa Esther of helping children who have children to have a better opportunity to have a better life and for their children to have a better life. We thank you that, that you allow us to be involved in your work and we ask that you would help us to be as involved as we can with prayer and through our contribution to you. And it's through Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you, Clark. And today is the day that we, uh, we take up our special contribution uh, for Hacienda of Hope. Uh, obviously, we're not passing a plate today, but there are uh, boxes in the lobbies uh, that you can place a contribution in. If you're a Twickenham member, you should have received a pledge card. You can mail that back in, drop it by the church office one day, or drop it in one of the boxes around the building. Or you can go online, twickenham.org, and on the, main, on the front page, there is uh, just at the top of the page, there's a picture of some folks from the Hacienda of Hope. Click on that, and it'll take you to a, a page that can, uh, you can give digitally in whatever format you feel comfortable or accustomed to. A Hacienda of Hope is our mission in Ecuador. It's a home for uh, abused, uh, abandoned, uh, neglected children, uh, and uh, it's a school, and we're totally invested in that. Uh, every year, we, we take up a special contribution. This year, we're hoping to hit around $290,000, and so far, contributions have been fabulous. If you're a member at Twickenham, we want you to give. And, and if you're not a member and you're watching online, you're invited to give as well. A lot of uh, folks that have never even set foot in this building uh, but have been watching online and seeing these videos have wanted to be a part of that. So we're very blessed to serve those kids down there. And those kids are so important to the Lord. We're just glad to be a part of that ministry. Uh, as we begin worship this morning, that's kind of what we're going to be thinking about is how very large the church, the body of Christ is, how very diverse it is, and how very unlike every other body, institution, organization in the world it is. Let me invite you to stand. Let me share a passage with you from the book of Revelation, chapter 5. And they sang a new song, saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its scrolls, open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God people from every tribe and language and people 
and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Let's worship the Lord together. No eye has seen, and no ear has heard, and no mind has ever conceived the glorious things that you have prepared for everyone who has believed. You brought us here, and you called us your own, and made us join heirs with your Son.
So in a couple of weeks, it's going to be Easter, and we are going to plan, we're planning something that is totally weather dependent. We want to, we want to have a service where we can all be together at one time outside. We're going to meet in this back parking lot, 930, is that what we're thinking? 10 o'clock? 9 o'clock? We don't, we'll, at some point in that morning, 9.30, I think it's 9.30, we're going to meet, we'll meet out here. We'll, send you, we'll be sending you some more information, and then we'll give you kind of the, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll make a call Saturday night about the weather, but we really want an opportunity to be together. Hey, this would be a great chance for you to, to bring somebody, because we're going to be outside, uh, that's kind of naturally, socially distanced, safer. Uh, so it'll be a good time for you to bring somebody, but that way on Easter we can all be together. Uh, so just be in prayer that God gives us a, a bright, sunny, clear, warm morning, all right? Uh, July 20th, 1969, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, and it was a Sunday. And as eager as, uh, as, they, as the astronauts were and everybody else was for them to make that first historic step onto the surface of the moon, NASA ordered a five-hour rest period after they landed. The, the, the physical exertion of, of getting there was, was significant, but the emotional and psychological stress of sitting on top of a rocket and riding that to the moon was a lot. And so everybody, everybody up there and everybody down in Houston and everywhere else just needed to take a breath, to relax for a minute, and get recentered. Uh, Buzz Aldrin, an elder in his Presbyterian church back in Houston, had already decided how he was going to use that time to recenter himself. He, he brought communion with him. In a small little case, uh, he had a small silver chalice, uh, a wafer, and a vial of wine. And sitting on the eagle lander, he, he served himself communion. And he wrote about that later on. He said, I poured the wine into the chalice our church had given me. In the one-sixth gravity of the moon, the wine curled slowly and gracefully up the side of the cup. It was interesting to think that the very first liquid ever poured on the moon, the very first food eaten there, were communion elements. And then he says, after he took it, he writes, I sensed strongly my unity with our church back home and with the church everywhere. We've not ridden a rocket to the moon, but in the last year, our, our, our lives have been rocked. I mean, we too need to be recentered. And so today and for the next few weeks, we're going to slow things down a little bit and try to think more deeply and try to experience more intentionally the Lord's Supper, or some churches call it communion, some churches call it the Eucharist. If you're, if you're watching or listening at home, you are very much a part of of what we are doing here in the house, whether you're here or not. You are certainly not further away from us than Buzz Aldrin was from his church back in Houston when he was on the moon in 1969. And if you're, if you're not a member of Twickenham, if you're not even a member of our tribe, the Churches of Christ, but you are a believer, you too are welcome to be a part of this because this is not our table. This is the Lord's table. So I want, to, I want to revisit a passage that we touched, touched on briefly last week. It's, uh, it's in the book of 1 Corinthians, which is about halfway through the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels. Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is where we'll be this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I want to start reading in verse 17. And then we're going to take some time to unpack that. And then we're going to share communion together after we've had time to think about what it really means. So here's what Paul writes, beginning in verse 17, 1 Corinthians 11. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. 
In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt, there have to be differences among you to show which of you has God's favor. A little apostolic uh, sarcasm there. So, verse 20, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. For what, when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. And as a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. So Paul is very clearly irritated with the Corinthian Christians. Um, he has been, in, 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 the, in the letter that he is writing to them, which we call 1 Corinthians, he is responding to things that they have written to him, and he's answering those issues a point at a time. And really, so far, he's been very diplomatic and gentle with him. He's using a, a yes, but kind of formula when he addresses the issues they're bringing up. He'll, he'll say something like, yes, I praise you about that, but you're missing the mark in this way. Yes, I love it that you're doing that, but I kind of wish you would stop that. But here, when you get to chapter 11, there is no yes. It's just but. It's I, I don't have any praise for you at all. What you are doing is making a mess of the Lord's Supper. In fact, when you come together, you're doing more harm than good. So what was it? that they were doing that was so unpraiseworthy? What made their services more, do more harm than good? We're, we're going to have to dig in a little bit and figure out what was going on in that circumstance here. So one of the key differences between the church and other groups or societies or organizations in Roman culture in those days was the church's social and economic diversity. Most organizations, most groups, guilds, unions were, were very, um, very similar, homogeneous in their demographic makeup. Everybody was pretty much just alike. That's why those groups came together. But the church was very different. It welcomed everybody regardless of their social or economic status. The rich sat next to the poor, the slave sat next to the free. Also in those days, there was, now we talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we did the, the, the study on the Sabbath. In those days, in the, Roman, in, in the Roman Empire, there was no weekend. There was no designated day or two off. If you worked, you worked at least a part of every day, if not all day, every day. And that's one of the reasons why early on the Christian, the Christian church met early on Sunday mornings or late on Sunday evenings because people had to work. And they usually met in the home of one of the more well-off members because they had room to accommodate everybody. And the churches were not huge back in those days, 20 or 30 members maybe. Communion, or the Lord's Supper, was observed as a part of what we would call a potluck meal. Uh, at the end of the Bible, in the book of Jude, last book of, next to the last book of the New Testament, Jude calls those love feasts. Um, we would call them potluck dinners. And so what they would do is everybody who could afford to would bring something to share. They would all sit down and eat together. And then toward the end of that meal, they would transition away from the potluck into the Lord's Supper. They'd share the bread and the wine and remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Now, if you were wealthy, if you, if you didn't have to work, you might show up an hour or two early. And, and just hang out with the host. Or if you were a free person who ran your own business, you might knock off early and, and get to church uh, before most people got there. But if you were a blue-collar employee, maybe you had to close the shop, maybe, or, 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 or if you were a slave and you had to wait until the master's needs were met, you know, the last thing you got to do is put the cat out at night. You can't put the cat out until the master or mistress goes to bed. And so you're stuck there until they're ready to close, to close things down. You, you might not be able to get back to church, get back to church and get to church until very, very late. So apparently this is what was happening. The wealthier members were starting to eat and drink before the less well-off members arrived. 
And so by the time the blue-collar Christians or the saved slaves got to church, the potluck was pretty much over. Casseroles had been consumed, the the desserts had been devoured, the the bottles had all been turned bottom up. And so you'd, you'd come in late and you'd sit down at the table and everything was gone except the communion bread and wine. So you'd get a little piece of bread and a little bit of wine and then all of your more well-off, more well-fed, more lubricated members, brothers and sisters, would listen to your stomach growl. Rather than leveling the socioeconomic ground at the, cro- at, at the table, where everybody was respected and honored, the way they were practicing the Lord's Supper was highlighting the differences. You, felt, you would have felt very, very conspicuous if you had walked in and tried to have communion with the folks that had already had a party. So Paul tells them what to do to fix this, verses 33 and 34. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home so that when you meet together, it will not result in judgment. In other words, if if you need to have your pre-party, do it at home before you gather with the rest of the church, but don't do things that humiliate people who don't bring a lot to the table, literally. Now, there's a part of this passage that we touched on last week that I want to go back to again uh, in uh, verses 27 through 30, because a lot of Christians read this next section, and they feel like they don't deserve to share the communion bread and wine. They, They feel like they're not worthy. And so they don't take part in this part of the worship service. And that is a gross misinterpretation of what Paul is saying in this passage. It's flat wrong. Let's read the passage, then I want to unpack it a little bit more for you to be sure that we know what he's saying and that we know what he's not saying. Okay? Uh, Verse 27, so then, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many of you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. He is not saying that if you have sinned recently or that if you've got some felony level sin on your record, that you don't deserve to eat the Lord's Supper. That is not what he means by unworthy. Some of the older translations of this will say, un- use the phrase, who eat, and drink the, the, the bre- eat the bread and drink the cup unworthily. And we've concluded from that translation that I, if I'm unworthy, I can't do this. It's not unworthy people Paul is talking about. It's an unworthy way of participating in communion, in the Lord's Supper, in the Eucharist. Uh, Author uh, Tony Campolo uh, tells a story from his experience that really drives this idea uh, of what Paul is talking about, not an unworthy person, but an unworthy way, drives that point home. He he was sitting in a a communion service with his mother and father when he was around six or seven years old. And there was a young woman sitting in front of them. And she, she heard the pastor read this passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And she took that to mean that she, because of whatever she had done, she was not worthy. And she began to weep. And she was just, she was weeping. And when the plate was passed, when the bread came to her, she waved it away because she felt like she was unworthy. Tony Campolo's father was Sicilian. And spoke in, a, in very broken English with a heavy Italian accent. And he leaned over and tapped the girl on the shoulder. And he said, take it, girl. This is for you. And she looked up and nodded. And then she, she took the bread and she ate it. And Campolo writes, I knew that at that moment, some kind of heavy burden was lifted from her heart and mind. And since then, I have always known that a church that could offer communion to hurting people was a special gift from God. 
listen to me. And if you're online, listen to me. Unworthy people are the only kind of people that ever gather at the communion table. Nobody in this room, nobody watching online, nobody anywhere in the world stands any taller than anybody else. The ground at the cross is level. So what what does it mean when Paul tells us not to take communion in an unworthy manner? Well, that's where there's some ambiguity. In verse 27, he says, "We, we take communion, we take the bread and the cup in an unworthy manner when we fail to discern the body of Christ. But which body is he talking about? Is he talking about the literal body of Jesus that hung on the cross? Or is he talking about the metaphorical body of Christ, the church? The truth is, the answer is yes. He's talking about the literal body of Christ, and he's talking about the metaphorical body, the church. But given the context a, a church that has been using communion to highlight the differences, the social, the demographic, the economic differences between its members, it seems to me that the body Paul is talking about is this one, the church. We are the body of Christ, which is something he said just one chapter earlier in First Corinthians ten seventeen. He said, because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we all share the one loaf. Discerning the body, then, means that we recognize, we realize, we appreciate, we honor, we welcome, we include all who honor Jesus as Lord. The things that separate us, our politics, our our social or economic status, In this part of the country, the ball teams that we root for, whether we believe in masks or not, whether we think vaccinations are are necessary or not, who we voted for, our skin color, our nationality, our sex, our intelligence, our body size, shape, looks, the kinds of work we do, all of those and any other human distinctions get checked at the door when we gather around this table because here we are of Christ, in Christ, we are the body of Christ. You see, communion is not just about your relationship with God. It's about your relationship with the body of Christ. It's certainly not wrong to think about the cross at communion, God forbid, we'll do that in coming weeks. But neither would it be wrong for you to think about how blessed you are to have brothers and sisters who know you and love you anyway. Neither would it be wrong for you to think about the fact that you have brothers and sisters you have never met but will one day meet when we are all brought together by the grace of God in heaven, in heaven, in eternity with him. See, communion reminds us that the body of Christ is way bigger and more inclusive and more diverse than we can possibly imagine. As we share communion this morning, I want you to catch a glimpse of just how Diverse, how beautifully different and yet united is the body of Christ. We're going to show you a video. and You, you may have seen it in some of your online searching, uh, but perhaps not. It, 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 it's about people. And the thing is, they don't, most of them don't look like me or you. They don't worship the way we do. They don't speak our language. We don't speak theirs. They most certainly have very different views of the world than you or I do. They dress a little funny. Their diet consists of things that we never consider eating. They're just so different than us. And yet, we share one thing in common that transcends every difference. They and we are all beneficiaries 
of God's amazing grace. Now, one thing I want you to notice when we watch this, some of the faces are blurred. They're blurred because the people live in places where it's not safe to be a Christian. So their identities are hidden. But their hearts and their faith are not. Watch. Changed in our world lately. Wo auch immer du bist, ruf seinen Namen an. Jesus. Don't wait another day.
Let's pray together. Holy Father, how great is your love, how wide your mercy. Never let us board up the narrow gate that leads to life with rules or teachings that are ours, not yours. Give us the spirit to welcome all people with affection so that your church may never exclude secret friends of yours who are included in the love of Jesus. Help us to be grateful for those members of your body that we have known long and well and loved deeply and help us to welcome with equal love those members of your body that we do not know and who are different than we. We are thankful to know that at this very moment, this very day, people all over the world are breaking bread and discerning the body of Christ. And some of them are thinking of us. Help the truth symbolized in this little wafer deepen our love for one another and for all who call on your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How beautiful the hands that serve, the wine and the bread, and the sons of the earth. How beautiful the feet that walk, the long dusty roads, and the hill to the cross. How beautiful. Father, giver of life, we pray for the church and the whole world. Sanctify her life, renew her worship, give power to her witnessing, restore her unity. We pray for those who worship you this morning in secret, for fear of being discovered and persecuted, not just pressured, but having their very lives threatened, the lives of 
them and their children. We pray for their protection. We pray that you would give strength to those who were searching together for the kind of obedience that creates unity. We pray that you would heal any division that separates your children from one another. Take from us any mistrust, party spirit, contention, and every evil that divides us. Help us to put aside personal grievances and embrace instead sacrificial, forgiving love, the kind of love and sacrifice symbolized in this cup. We pray this through the grace, mercy, and tenderness of your son, Jesus. Amen. One heart, one spirit, one voice to praise you. We are the body of Christ. One goal, one vision to see you exalted. We are the body of Christ.
thanks so much for being here today. Seems like every week I'm seeing a face that I haven't seen for a year, like literally, right? So it's good to see some of you who are, are coming back, and that's just awesome. Uh, a couple things as we close. There is a shower today for Allison Brown and Jackson Ledford. That is 1 to 3 at the Mercy Building. It's a drive through shower. You can just pull up in your car, drop off, say hi, get a cookie, whatever they do with those things. Um, also, another shower next week for Lance Clark. That will also be down at the Mercy Building. We'll remind you again about that next week. But again, thanks for being here. May the amazing grace of Jesus bless you and give you peace. We'll see you next Sunday.